just about ready to transition to our next uh, speaker, our next guest. And I'm so happy to uh, introduce Suzanne Pena from uh, SMP Education Consulting to be here. As Suzanne mentioned earlier, she's also stepped right in um, and acting secretary, interim secretary for the board and has been incredibly influential and instrumental in helping us uh, think through a lot of um, recent, you know, the recent social context, political context and the work of educators across the state. That is in part because of her expertise and her background being, um, being a bilingual learner herself and a dual language program growing up. She's been an educator in K-20 settings for over 16 years. Uh, started her career as a teacher in New York City in Title I schools, served as district coordinator for ESL bilingual program world languages in the Amityville Union Free School District. Uh, she notes that in addition to monitoring implementation of regulations, she supervised and assisted teachers in grades K through 12, aligning curriculum and instruction to meet the rigor of common core learning standards and bilingual common core language arts progressions. She served as an instructional coach, supervisor, evaluator of bilingual English as a new language teacher in the school district and was a new language program coordinator in Harlem, New York. Suzanne has also held the position of adjunct instructor in Brooklyn College for bilingual and multicultural education. And she's held the position of director and project manager for the dual language steps program that was just mentioned by Jerry Chaffee um, where these cohorts, of, uh, cohorts of, of teachers are going through and receiving credentialing in dual language programs, really important in the state. Suzanne is, in the lead, is a lead education consultant with SMP Education Consulting. She is pursuing her doctorate in adult education, social justice at Kansas State. So, Suzanne, um, thank you so much for your time today, and I'll turn it over to you. Okay, I think you're I have to have you on mute there, Suzanne. Oh, there you go. Is it good? Can you hear me now? I do know. Can you hear? A school board member who recently retired as head of the Hello? Can you hear me? Council. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited um, to be here and sharing some of the lessons um, that we have learned. And where do we go from here? How do we elevate? Um, because that's all where we what we need to do, we, um, uh, Maria mentioned it at the beginning, right? We have such a wonderful, rich history with bilingual education here in Florida, but you know what? It's time that we elevate it. We need to kick it up a notch, right? We can't just be stagnant anymore. We have to, and I'm gonna bring a little bit of my New York swag up in here, right? We have to elevate, right? We have to elevate bilingual education here in Florida. How do we go about doing that? Um, just a few, uh, just, to kind of give you a little bit um, of background, I know Maria did a fantastic job as to who I am and my uh, my uh, my background. But um, I also wanted to share with you that I am the product of bilingual education. I went to a dual language school my entire life from pre-K all the way to senior year of high school. I graduated um, fully bilingual, fully biliterate. Um, and, uh, and then not only that, I was, a, I started as a bilingual teacher in New York City Public Schools, became an administrator of bilingual programs as well in New York. And um, I brought that expertise down here as well. And now I'm a mom, I'm a mom and I am, uh, I sent my son to a, a, a bilingual daycare and I am doing the bilingual education, the dual language, I am doing it at home. Um, so. I see it from three different angles as well when it comes to bilingual education. So it's not something that I, I believe, not only do I believe in it, but I have lived it and breathed, uh, and, and breathed bilingual education. So here's a little bit about um, my contact information. Um, I have a couple social media platforms if you're interested. Um, I'm constantly uploading a couple videos and whatnot, so you can check those out. And so let's talk about a little bit of what are we gonna do today? What is our goal today? And I'm always about goals, right? Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about familiarizing ourselves, right? With the pillars of dual language education and the strands that are identified in the guiding principles of dual language education. 
specifically the third edition. And if you haven't, um, if you don't know, now you know. This is actually the document that you need to get your hands on, okay? We're gonna reflect as to where the state of our dual language programs, where are we at? Um, if we're starting, it doesn't matter whether we're starting, if we um, have a long history of dual language education, we're going to reflect where we're at, and then we're going to actually base our decisions and we're gonna start moving forward and we're gonna start elevating our programs to the next level. All righty, so as I mentioned, if you haven't seen this document, if you don't have a copy, I strongly, strongly encourage you to download a free copy of the Guiding Principles for Dual Language Education. This is, um, I know Lorena and some of the other participants were talking about uh, during Dr. Pacheco's uh, presentation, how do I advocate? How do, where do I start? Where do I go and find the research? Well, this is a good starting place. What do I go and take back to my administrator? What do I um, show the community? Well, this is a great place. And if you don't have it, I suggest you download it. As I mentioned, it's free if you download it. Now, if you wanna uh, get a, an actual hard copy of it, you can go ahead and purchase it. But I always, I'm, I'm still a teacher at heart. So I believe if I can download it for free, <laughs> hey, I'm gonna go <laughs> go do that, right? Bueno, bonito y barato. Those are my three Bs I always say. So let's now start thinking about the pillars of dual language education, right? And so for all of my math teachers out there, right, they say, and quote unquote, that the triangle, right, is the sturdiest of structures or forms, right? That's what they say, a triangle, right? So let's start thinking of the pillars of dual language education just the same way, as a triangle. And in those three pillars, we have the bilingualism and biliteracy, which we already know, right? We have a high academic achievement, but that other pillar, that social cultural competence. And as, uh, as Dr. Pacheco mentioned earlier, right? That all plays into the translanguaging, to all of this advocacy, it plays into that. But what happens a lot of times? A lot of times with programs, right? We may have two of the pillars and we're strong with those two pillars, but then that third pillar is missing. And if it's missing, right? If any of those three pillars are missing, our programs are not going to be successful. So I invite you today, if there's one thing that you take out from this webinar is actually going ahead and looking at your programs and making sure that every single decision that is made for dual language programs are actually centered in these three pillars, okay? Now, those of you that have uh, seen me before in webinars and things like that, or checked out my YouTubes or attended any of my sessions, I, I always like games, all right? Teacher at heart, I like games, I like trivias, and I like giveaways. So let's begin with that, okay? So who can tell me quickly, first person that can go ahead on the chat, private chat, right? You're gonna send me a message. How many pillars, how many strands are in the guiding principles of dual language education? How many are they? And please name three, please name three. So the first person, there's always a prize. So I always give out prizes. So please go ahead on um, using the chat. Okay, go ahead, private message me first person. How many? Ooh, I started to get some, uh, some uh, Maria. Casi, 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 casi. Almost, 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 dale. Who else, who else? Uh, I, okay, I know Maria's trying, Maria's trying, but <laughs> Maria Carreras, I believe. Uh, we almost missed it, almost missed it. One more, one more. All right, I think it's not, it's not that number, Maria Carrera. So if you wanna go ahead and check it out and return to that. All right, going once. Maria Carrera's got two of these strands. We need one more. Josie, que pasa? No, 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 14, no. All right, all right, all right, I see. All right, I see that. Um, I think I got somebody here that said uh, the person that actually, okay. Daddy, you are correct. There are seven. Thank you so much for pointing that out. Yes, there are seven 
seven strands, and those are very important. And if you don't know them, I am going to kind of brief you on them. And they're very important because these are the ones that are going to guide your decisions, any decision, whether you're a teacher, whether you're an administrator, whether you are a superintendent, okay? You have, you have, you have to guide yourself with these, okay? Anything that you do when it comes to dual language has to be centered with these. And the first one is your program structure. Then you have curriculum and instruction, which I, I find them that they tend to be, you know, together. Assessment and accountability, staff quality and professional development, family and community engagement. I'm not gonna say involvement, I'm gonna say engagement. There's a difference, okay? And support and resources. And we've been talking a little bit about that throughout the different presentations today, how all of these strands play a part, uh, such an integral part in the success of our dual language programs. So where do we begin? Where do we begin, right? We have our program structures and even for those programs that have actually already been in play for a while, it's always good to go back to the drawing board and see where we're at, right? Are we ensuring are our dual language programs are they ensuring equity for all groups? Okay, that's very important. Jerry mentioned equity, right? We have to be equitable. Now, also going back to that part about the program, does it have a strong and effective knowledgeable leadership? Hey, I know Lorena brought up this point um, in Dr. Pacheco's uh, presentation and she mentioned, um, she said, well, how do I get my administrators, right? How do I how do I show them? What what do I information I go with, right? Jerry mentioned about bringing your data. Data is very important and very strong, as well as you can start with the guiding principles. That is a place that you can go to. Why? Because the research is there. It shows it, okay. And then also inviting them. If you don't want to have that awkward conversation, invite them to things like like the Fabe um, conference that we're having today. Say, hey, you know what? I think this would be a great idea. I just recently had um, a webinar in where um, at another in another state and the teachers actually invited the superintendent to join the webinar. And they were like, hey, Dr. Such and Such, we would love for you to come and, you know, we've been attending this fantastic webinar series. I suggest you come and join us. And you know what she did, she popped in. It was only for like a couple minutes, but she popped in and she wanted to find out what was happening, okay? These are great ways to start that conversation, okay? And the, it, I know, I get it, as a teacher, it can be intimidating, right? It can be intimidating to go ahead and, and, and say to your principal, hey, come, come over here. But you know what, it's a conversation. We can start that conversation going. Or just even say, oh my gosh, I went to this amazing, you can even start with it next week, right? I went to this amazing conference at Fabe. I learned so much, right? I encourage you to come to the coffee hours. They're so cool. That, as simple as that. But it's very important that everybody's on the same page, that everybody knows, um, has knowledge about it. We're not talking about becoming experts in the field. We're talking about knowing what dual language is, okay? Now, that um, those other two strands that we have, curriculum and instruction, and I decided to put them both together because it's very important, they go hand in hand, right? And when we're talking about curriculum and instruction, especially in a dual language program or a bilingual program, because you can also implement uh, many of these in a transitional dual language, uh, in a transitional bilingual program, it is very important that when we're doing this, when we are designing the curriculum, when we're having uh, curriculum map discussions and all that, we are not just teaching, as I call it, let's say that Spanish is the target language. We're not teaching Spanish for fun, right? We are really diving in. We are using instructional me uh, methods that are research-based, okay? We are following the three core goals of dual language education, right? We are implementing technology in a meaningful way, okay? And that we have standards. I understand that in the state of Florida, we don't have standards that particularly go with dual language education when it comes to Spanish or other target languages. 
but we should not water down the target language instruction. It should be as rigorous as English. It should not be watered down, okay? All righty. Now, this part, I see um, assessment and accountability, right? Um, I know that Drew mentioned about having um, uh, home language assessments uh, is something that we're striving for here in the state of Florida because it's honestly a very key component. But how do we go ahead and start even at the, at the smallest of levels? How do we start even just in our classroom, right? An assessment can start with just even progress monitoring our students in both languages, not just English, right? But also in Spanish, right? How are we doing that? Are we doing that consistently and across the board? If we have a dual language program or we're starting one in a school, are those dual language assessments co cohesive and coherent all throughout the entire, um, all the grades that are implemented in dual language? Or do we have like di a different thing here for third grade, a different thing here for fourth grade, um, a different thing for kindergarten? No, uh, we have to have it cohesively. Are we having those data chats? Um, is everybody on the same page in terms of getting the information from these assessments and knowing where our students are at? whether, you know, not only in English, but also in the target language. And that is very, very, very important. And also, are we communicating this to all our stakeholders? And I don't mean we're communicating this to our instructional coach or just our um, principal or whatnot. No, everybody is on board with these. Um, I got, I, I want to mention there was, um, I, many schools have done it where they have these uh, meetings and it's district wide where they have these conversations to kind of get gauge where their students are at in the target language in the um, in, uh, in in different schools that have a dual language program and that is very 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 important and also not only accountability right when it comes to assessing uh, the effectiveness of a program it's very important that we're incorporating our families. Okay, this is not just finding out when the um, the uh, the old snap moment, right? When, oh, we get a complaint from families or anything like that. No, we have to keep them engaged and knowing so that they can give us an assessment of how the program is doing from their perspective as well. So that is very important to keeping our families engaged in bilingual education. Now, Staff and staff quality and professional development. I'll tell you, I'll share you, I'll share with you a, a quick anecdote. When I, um, when I came down to Florida, uh, when I moved down, I, I was, before I moved down, I was calling the state, um, the Department of Education uh, for Florida. And I was having a conversation with the agent that was on the phone with me. And he goes ahead and I'm like, he's like, yeah, all your, all your licenses got transferred, not a problem, you're good to go. Um, with the exception of your bilingual education teaching certificate. And I was like, hmm? what you talking about? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> the name of the state is in Spanish, Florida. I, I mean, like, what do you mean there's the, the, the what happened? Do I need to get like extra classes or what do I need to do in order to, for it to transfer? And he was like, nope, um, we just don't have any. Uh, we have ESOL and we have ESOL endorsements and ESOL certificates and we have Spanish. And I said, no, mm -mm. Uh, uh, no, the, 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 what about bilingual? <laughs> and it's, it's, it's different. I, 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 I need that. You know, what, what happened? What do you mean there's nothing? And it's very interesting that there isn't. Still to this day, there isn't. Um, I have this you know, teaching certificate from New York um, that I can't use. I could use, I transfer all of the other ones, but I can't transfer that one because it does not exist. And that is something, yes, very well, Chap, uh, Jerry, we have to go ahead and change that. That is something that we need. And it did not, Kathy sharing also that it did not transfer. And it's, it, it, it's a shame, why? Because if we want to make sure that our dual language programs are successful, we have to equip them with 
staff that is highly trained. And it, it begs that uh, component. We have to make sure that we are providing them they are going now. We have the UCF program. We I recently found out that um, Universidad Interamericana de Puerto Rico, the Inter-American University of Puerto Rico at, in Orlando has recently just opened a master's degree in bilingual education, okay? And they're going to be doing it in both languages, English and Spanish. So we are getting the universities to do this, but we also need it to be at the state so that when teachers are going to go for these programs, they feel like, hey, I have a license that I can go ahead and, and represent, right, for what I've done. And it is so, so, so important. And thank you, Maria, for actually talking about that. Uh, I am more than happy to be on the, on the back line you know, because I will be the first one to get a uh, teacher's uh, credentialing um, here in the state of Florida because I think it is very needed. Um, while uh, by dual language education falls in, in the umbrella of with other programs such as ESOL, it is still different. Dual language is different. So I think it is very important that we give it is due date, you know, like we have to make sure that we um, applaud that. Also making sure, right, that when we're talking about our, our, our professional development, we're not just talking about, okay, I gave my uh, I, a teacher's got a couple hours here of some uh, uh, ESOL strategies, or they got a you know a couple little sprinkles here and there. No, they need, they need, they need their own professional development. Okay, that is geared towards them. Okay, specifically for dual language education. I'm sorry, this is not. We're, there's no way around that. Okay, and also I'm starting to see that teachers are actually asking and districts are asking for um, professional development in the target language. So no longer even in English. I'm getting I'm getting requests because people need. Hey, they, uh, we need it in Spanish. We need it in. Um, yes, yes, that, that might be a potential goal, Kathy. Yes, for Fave 2021, right? Putting that out there, right? Because teachers need this. They need this, okay? And it's important for all my administrators out there as well to make sure that you're incorporating this as well, okay? And making those partnerships, making those partnerships um, uh, and making sure that we're collaborating with institutions. Like there's a wonderful partnership with UCF, with UNF, with uh, FIU, making those connections. And it's important to supporting our dual language programs. And if you don't have them already, I suggest and I encourage you, hey, right here at Fabe, you have a lot of people that can help you with this, okay? Now, um, my family and community engagement, this is so, 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 yes, uh, Josie, certification and funding, so important, right? That's my last slide. You jumped, uh, you went ahead of me. Uh, but yes, family and community engagement, I encourage you, if you don't have, if you have maybe a dual language committee, okay, at your school or at your district or whatever, I encourage, make sure that you have parents representing there. If you don't, you should, okay? That is something. They need to be part of the equation. They need to be part of the decision-making, okay? I see that. I know that uh, Jerry in her school, she's always already put that into the equation even before the school has even opened. <laughs> okay, that's part of the equation of her, of her model. And it's very important that we do so. And if we don't, I encourage you to do, because let me tell you something, in my previous experience, um, especially in Harlem, my parents were, I, I didn't even have to open my mouth. And I have a big mouth, I'll tell you that, but I didn't even have to open my mouth because the parents were already advocating before I even thought about advocating. They were already knocking on doors. And that is so important. Now, um, now when we talk about the last part, let's talk about resources and, and, and support. And this is why that advocacy from parents is so important because you know what? They have a lot of power, believe it or not, that they can advocate or sometimes think that we can't even advocate as educators, right? We, we, we might be a little bit um, constrained as to what we can advocate for. 
Um, and we can actually encourage parents and give them that opportunity and they can advocate for the support and the resources that we need. And also for my administrators out there, making sure that when you are planning for future years, okay, you are thinking ahead of the April. Okay, so if we're thinking about making, doing, implementing a dual language program or starting pre-K or K, you know what, we're thinking about, not, we're not thinking about just ending it in fifth grade, uh-uh, mm -mm, no more. We're thinking about high school. Why? Because Florida has the seal of biliteracy. So there's no excuse why we can't think about dual language programming all the way to high school. And if you don't think that it's possible, hey, I am the living embodiment of that, okay? It can be done all the way to high school, okay? So, um, yes, and make sure, uh, thank you, Maria, for sharing that, making sure that parents are informed of the programs and understanding what, it's, what it entails. Um, I, I did a wonderful podcast with, uh, on Jerry's show explaining it to parents in Spanish, and actually Manatee County has used it now um, as their way of, of, of explaining to parents what is dual language. Um, so it's in Spanish, you could go ahead and use it. Um, anywho, pa'lante, um, nunca pa' atrás. And I continue to encourage you to do this uh, for our students. They are our future and we do nef definitely need to, uh, to help our students become fantastic citizens of the future. So thank you so much to everyone. Um, here again is my contact information. If you have any questions, uh, you can go ahead and tell me on the chat. And uh, it was a pleasure. Pleasure as always. Ex excellent. Gracias. Muy bien. Muy bien. Gracias. Y muchas gracias. And uh, wow, so much information here and enthusiasm. Um, I love what's also going on in the chat. Um, uh, and, and certain needs in the Florida community that we can we can find resolutions for relatively quickly to um, to support schools and outreach in the growth of schools. Um, any any questions? We have time for a question. I think from the audience. I just I just have a couple just some very quick comments that I'll make super quick. Um, first of all, Sudan, thank you, thank you, thank you once again for your. Um, for your presentation, your information, your enthusiasm, your energy. It was really great. Suzanne, I just wanted to share with you that as I was listening to you that a lot of the changes that you see that occur, I don't know um, exactly when, you said you grew up in New York, but a lot of the changes that came out of New York was as a result of many of us as educators sitting in chancellor's offices and bringing about change, starting from um, changing in terms of Haitian students because Haitian students were lumped under for a one time. Black students, yes, we are black students, but but we really needed to have a separate identity for Haitian students so that Haitian students could get the necessary funding, Haitian programs for bilingual programs. And the, New York didn't get that initially, so we had to go in and we met with every chancellor, sat in their offices, went to Albany, I mean, and the parents, fought and fought and fought for so many things um, in order for us to get what we ended up getting in New York and some of the outstanding leaders there as well. Then um, the other point also is that we are developing a, um, a dual language program in West Palm Beach. It's starting off with K-2 and it is happening, it is working. And in the areas of curriculum and instruction, one of the things that we're doing is, um, we're, it's really interesting. We are looking at the Haitian curriculum and then we are comparing it to the Florida best standards and already uh, just very quickly in looking at the differences because we want to also celebrate what it is that Haitian students are bringing in into the classroom and so we are looking at it and doing that comparison and just very quickly because I started comparing the two I, in, even in phonological awareness and phonemic awareness I'm finding that what Haitians, what's done in Haiti is somewhat very different in terms of sound. Just a super quick example, Haitian, uh, in the Haitian curriculum, they pay particular attention to not only the sounds dealing with language, but sounds in the environment. And they start with that, with the, with the sounds. In, so what does, um, 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 not, not lightning, thunder, 
What does thunder sound like? So there is a part in the curriculum, even though we, there is that bridge to phonemic awareness, phonological awareness as we know it here, but Haitian students bring a different, an additional part to phonological and phonemic awareness that if we did not look at that Haitian curriculum, we would never have known that. So in curriculum and instruction, incredibly important. The last point that I would like to make is, and comparing to different countries and what children are coming in with, incredibly important for our dual language program. Last point is around formative assessment. And I think that we give so much, we play, um, we look at summative assessments um, so much that we don't take into consideration the, um, not as much, how formative assessments in our classroom can really guide our curriculum and our instruction. So I think that as we're talking about dual language programs, we also need to pay particular attention and, and, and encourage the use of formative assessments in our schools, in our classrooms, again, in order to help to guide our, our curriculum. So we wanna know what is it that our students know through our formative assessment, not just at the summative assessment level, just all of the check marks that they were able to learn. There is a difference between the two. And so those are uh, the key components that sometimes is often, I think, left out in terms of developing dual language programs. So I just wanted to just quickly share those with everyone. So once again, and, Suzanne, thank and, you. And actually, Edwidge, you, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. It is so important, and if we just think about though that triangle, if you take one thing out of what I uh, what I mentioned today, that triangle, that social cultural competency, that speaks to that because when we are doing our curriculum mapping and all of these things, or we're purchasing programs for our dual language schools, we need to ensure that we're doing exactly what you mentioned, right? Making sure that hey, are we talking about phonological awareness and this and that, and how does it look here? How does it look there? How does it look for the target language? Having those conversations is very important and not just taking kind of the, uh, the, the programs, right, um, at heart and just saying, okay, this is perfect and this is nice and packaged and pretty. Now let, let, let's really dive deep into it and, and having that conversation because we may have to add some stuff to that. And so thank you so much. And actually in 